Hello, Trinity. Welcome back to our online service. We're so grateful that you are here with us today, and we would love to know that you're here with us. Um, if you could just take a second and fill out our Connect card at trinitybible.link connect. Let us know you're there, um, how we can be praying for you. And to request something that Pastor Brad will talk about later. So maybe if you want to wait until the end to fill out that Connect card. But I'm going to remind you now. Be thinking about it. I'll We'll let you know what you're going to get at the end. So fill out that connect card later. Uh, beyond that, um, we're so happy you're here for the second sermon in our Jonah series. Um, it's it's really exciting. I hope you're enjoying this. Look at a story that I teach to kids all the time, but we, we don't really dig too deep into it like Pastor Brad's going to do with us. So Keep an open mind, enjoy, and let's worship together with Charlie, and then I'll see you at the end. Welcome to our service here at Trinity Bible Church. I'm so glad you're able to tune in and come and worship with us today. And I would just simply ask that you take a moment, that you take a moment and ask God to meet you here in this place. He's already here. He meets us in our worship as we praise his name. Let us sing together. Let us worship and sing his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are made. Our 
God sent his son to save a wretch like me and a wretch like you. Let us worship him because of that.
Hi, Trinity. Great to be with you and looking forward to our study today. I appreciate your faithful presence in our online service as we uh, keep our spiritual fervor and we maintain these rhythms that help us stay connected with each other, help us stay connected with God and His Word on a weekly basis. Very important for us. And so glad to see you being part of that and making our time together a priority. So today uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of Jonah, Jonah the man who ran. And today what we're going to talk about is the weakest link. Now depending on your age, when, when you hear the phrase the weakest link, you may think of a one thing or another. You might think of uh, the game show from the early 2000s. Uh, or you might, you might, when you hear the weakest link, you might think of its remake from just this year. Uh, but before it was a game show, the weakest link was a proverb that went something like this. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And that's common sense, right? All it takes to compromise, compromise a strong chain is one, just one, weak link. Well, today we're going to meet the weakest link in God's plan to save a city. It's a link so weak that it endangers the whole chain of God's rescue plan, because God wants to rescue the city of Nineveh, this out-of-control society that was the center of savage power in the ancient Near East uh, during the time of the prophet Jonah around 750 BC. And this city, Nineveh, is the, it's part of the nation of uh, Assyria. And it's different from many of the other cities that we read about in the Old Testament because this was a city of Gentiles. It wasn't a Jewish city in Israel. This was a Gentile city full of pagans who uh, did not know the true God, Yahweh, were not part of God's covenant people. And uh, it's easy to think that the Old Testament is about God's relationship with the people of Israel. But there are many places in our Old Testament where we see God's heart for Gentiles, for non-Jews, people who are not part of his covenant people at that point in time. And the story of Jonah is one of those where we see that God wants to save Nineveh. He wants to save these pagan Gentiles from the judgment that they've earned by their idolatry and their savagery. And he wants to save them. He wants to rescue them from his own judgment. But first, they have to repent. They have to acknowledge that, that, that Yahweh is the true God and that they are living in rebellion against him. But in order for them to repent, first they have to hear about the true God and their sin and the impending judgment that that sin may bring. And so God has a plan to deliver that message to the people of Nineveh. And therein lies the problem. Because the man that God has told to go to Nineveh with this message is Jonah. And Jonah has told God no. And that's a problem. Jonah is the link between God's mercy and Nineveh's rescue. It's a great plan, God's desire to spare the Ninevites. That's, and, and really, that's why you would announce judgment, right? Uh, only if you have a plan to spare them. Because God gets a bad rap in the Old Testament, especially for sending messages of judgment. But think of this. 
Only a gracious, merciful God would send a message of impending judgment. Messages of judgment give opportunities for repentance. Otherwise, you just destroy a city with no message at all. Announcing impending doom is a great display of God's mercy and his patience and his fairness and forbearance. You're doomed, and I'm telling you that so that you can repent and I can forgive. The problem is, this message depends on Jonah, and Jonah is the weakest link. We saw last week how Jonah refused God's plan for his life. He ran from God. Uh, Remember in verse 3 in Jonah chapter 1, it says, Jonah ran away from Yahweh, from the Lord, and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for port, uh, for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So he runs from God uh, because he doesn't trust God's plan. He doesn't like God's character, God's loving attitude towards the Ninevites. And he thinks that he can outrun God. And that's what he tries to do. He goes to Joppa, hires a boat, and heads for the Timbuktu of the ancient Near East, a place called Tarshish. And that's where we find Jonah today on his way to Tarshish. Now, you know the story, but we're going to read it again. It's full of just beautiful irony and uh, some really important truths. So let's read this passage, then we're going to walk back through it, talk about it, and then we're going to draw some principles from it. Uh, As we read, beginning in chapter 1, verse 4. Then the Lord, remember in capital L-O-R-D, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And all the sailors were afraid, and each cried to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell in a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, so that we will not perish. And then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Well, this terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. And the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make, uh, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me in the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to Yahweh, Please, Yahweh, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Yahweh, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah, and they threw him overboard, and the raging sea, grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered him, uh, they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows to him. So here we have Jonah, who thought that when he ran from God, that everything was going to fall into place and that running from God was going to work for him. And it did for a while. Running from God went great. But then he got on this boat to Tarshish, And that's when God goes to work. In verse 4, we see uh, that uh, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. There's a great Hebrew word that's used four times in this chapter. And it's the word to hurl. King Saul, it's a word that's used of King Saul. uh, When uh, Saul hurls a javelin at David to try to kill him. And that word is used four times in this passage. 
We see it in verse 5 when the sailors, uh, they hurl the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. We see it in verse 12 when Jonah says, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. And we see it in verse 15 when the sailors finally take him up on this and they hurl him overboard. But the first time we see this word, we see it right here in verse 4. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. I almost titled this message, What Makes God Hurl? A hint, it's the same thing that makes the whale hurl. I'll tell you what makes God hurl. A man who endangers thousands of souls because he doesn't share God's merciful heart. So God hurls. He gathers up a great wind and he hurls it straight at Jonah. But Jonah doesn't care. He's the perfect picture of not caring beginning in verse uh, the middle of verse 5 where he goes below deck and he uh, lays down and falls into a deep sleep that's the hebrew phrase uh, very emphatic it's the same sleep that god put adam in when he did surgery on his rib to create eve it's a deep sleep so jonah is sawing logs down in the bottom of the ship and nobody can wake him up and by this point the storm is in full force and the gentiles above are hurling they're hurling cargo over the side of the boat trying to lighten its load jewish tradition tells us that that uh what they were throwing overboard at this point were the gods that they'd prayed to a few minutes before and had been of no use to them so they're they're panicking they're frantic they're fighting for their lives and jonah the man of god god's representative is sleeping i mean it's a sad picture the gentiles are fighting for their lives and the man who put them in danger who is supposed to represent the heart of god the heart of yahweh to them is sound asleep it's a portrait of apathy and indifference to god and the world you gentiles you can go to hell i'm taking a nap so for the first of several times in this chapter these salty sailors act more christian than the christian they pray they pray to their gods and then the captain comes in uh, verse 6 to jonah and uh and asks the, the the pagan captain asks the man of god to pray they will they want to find, after he calls them to pray, the sailors get together in verse 7. As we work our way through this passage, they say, hey, let's, let's figure out who's responsible for this. So they cast lots, probably using uh, colored pebbles or something like that, similar to like how we might use dice today. And the guy who gets snake eyes is the culprit. And so guess who gets the sh short straw here? God providentially, the first of many providential, well, not the first, but one of many providential acts in the book of Jonah, he directs the lots to point to Jonah. And when they find out that Jonah's responsible for this mess, look at verse 8, they bombard him with questions. Who's responsible for making all this trouble? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? They're just desperately trying to find an angle on Jonah that's going to give them an opportunity to save uh, him and themselves. They want to know what he's up to and why they have to go down with him. And Jonah's answer is one of the low points of the book. There are several low points in the book of Jonah, and the prophet Jonah is always in very close proximity uh, to those low points. He makes this tremendous statement, but it, it ironically is a low point in the book. He answers them, and he says in verse 9, I am a Hebrew, and I worship Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Really? I mean, Jonah's answer here is the height of hypocrisy. I am a Hebrew, especially, he says, I worship Yahweh. The word worship is really the word to fear. And uh, Jonah is telling these sailors, I am a Hebrew, 
And I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Really? You fear Yahweh? That's why you won't do what he says, right? I mean, that's why you run when he tells you what to do, right? That's what, right, why when he says, go east, you go west, right? Because you fear him so much. I mean, Jonah's like a lot of us today. Uh, he's got a great orthodox confession. He's got a nice doctrinal statement, but it looks ridiculous when you measure it against his life. And, and it scares these, these pagan sailors silly because they come from a culture where there's a God for everything. There's a God for their city. There's a God for the valley. There's a God for the coastline. There's a God for the storm. There's a God for the boat. There's a God for the whole ocean. They had a God for all these different things. So when they hear that this guy worships Yahweh, the God of everything, it says the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land, then they're terrified because they were on a boat in the ocean in a storm with a guy who thumbed his nose at the God of everything. I mean, it's one thing to thumb your nose at the God of the boat or the God of the ocean or the God of the storm because if you thumb your nose at one of those, you've got two others still able to help you. But when you thumb your nose at the God of everything, man, that's crazy. And that's exactly what Jonah had done. So they say, okay, well, what should we do? What should, what should we do to you, they say, to make the sea calm down for us? And he says, hurl me overboard. Uh, he doesn't offer to jump, but he says, you can throw me if you want. And they don't want to do that. So they dig those rows in even more. They did their best, verse 13, to row back to, to land. They just couldn't. The, the storm had grown progressively out of control. And uh, it's no use. They finally give up. And they pray for forgiveness for what they're about to do. And then they throw Jonah in the water. And then something really scary happens. The storm stops. And if you think they were scared before, you should see them now. Now that the water has calmed immediately, they are really scared because they know they have just encountered the true God of everything, the God of the heavens who made the sea and the land. And they go from this general fear earlier in the passage to this very specific fear in uh, verse 16 of specific fear from a general fear of just what's happening to a very specific fear at this the men greatly feared Yahweh they knew they'd encountered the, the God of everything and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him so ironically they stop and worship the true God and Jonah ends up inside a fish that's what happens it's a crazy story it's full of irony and uh, all kinds of meaning packed into this story so what are we supposed to make of it well what stands out in this uh, story and what happens to Jonah is the fragility of the link between God's great mercy and the people who need it. I mean, God doesn't write his messages for Nineveh out in the sky. He communicates his message to a needy people through his people. And uh, people who already know and follow him. And here's the stark reality. God communicate, or God's, God's people are the link between God's mercy and the people who need it. And it was true in Jonah's day. He's the link between God's mercy and the people of Nineveh. Passage, our whole chapter starts out, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. God wants to bring these people to a point of repentance so that he can forgive them and not punish them. Jonah is the link between 
God's mercy and the people of Nineveh, but he is a weak link. Today, we are the link between God's mercy and the salvation of others. Paul makes that very clear in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he talks about reconciliation. And Paul says this, he says, uh, God gave us, this is 2 Corinthians 5, halfway through verse 18, God gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. What a great message. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's exactly what's happening in this passage. Jonah is is God's messenger of reconciliation, and today we are God's messengers of reconciliation. And God communicates his message to a needy world through the people who already know him. It's part of being a disciple of Jesus. But it's a huge responsibility. It's a risky responsibility. It's a scary responsibility. We share some things in common with Jonah when he, and the feelings, conflicted feelings he experiences about going to Nineveh. So we're tempted to run from this responsibility just like Jonah ran from his. But when we run from this challenge, we run from our responsibility as messengers of reconciliation. We run from our ambassadorship to represent God and his heart to people that he wants to forgive, to uh, our friends and our family members, the people we work with, the people we live near. And when we run from that responsibility, we display some of the same inconsistencies that Jonah did. Uh, There are three things that stand out in in this, uh, what happens to Jonah here that that, uh, uh, happens to us when we run from our, our role of representing Jesus. First, when we run from representing Jesus, we display hypocrisy. Now, maybe hypocrisy is too strong of a word. Call it inconsistency. Call it uh, cognitive dissonance or whatever. But whatever we call it, we see it in Jonah, and we see it in us when we run from our responsibility to represent Jesus. See, we see it in Jonah when he says that he worships, he fears the God of everything. He says he fears him, he worships, but in reality, he defies him and doesn't obey him. And the big irony in this chapter is it's really these uh, sailors, these pagan sailors who act more like God followers than Jonah does. It's the pagans who have the faith to pray to their gods. It's the pagans who display compassion. They don't want to throw Jonah overboard. It's the, the pagans who are the ones who really fear God, and they're the ones in, the, in uh, this episode who, who end up worshiping God, not Jonah. It's the pagans who do that. This is in great contrast to the actions of Jonah. And think about this. Uh, It's a contrast in this passage between those who know God and and don't act like it and those who don't know God and act more like they do. And it makes us ask the question today, how is it that people who don't know God sometimes seem to care more about people than those who do. How is it that Angelina Jolie cares for the poor more than many Christians do? How is that? Why are we not as worried about fresh water and education and mosquito nets and the pandemic as Bill Gates is? Why is that? And beyond that, why aren't we at least as worried about people's eternal destinies as Bill Gates is about their day-to-day existence? When we run from representing Jesus, we display hypocrisy. We reveal our cognitive dissonance where we have an orthodox theology. Jesus is the only way to God, and every person's destined for uh, heaven or hell based on what they do with this truth. We display an orthodox theology, but an apathetic attitude. 
We proclaim our allegiance to God, but we don't live it out in the way that we represent him to people. We display hypocrisy, just like Jonah, when we run from our role of representing Jesus. Secondly, when we run from our responsibility to represent Jesus, we endanger people as a result. As a result of our hypocrisy, we end up putting other people in danger, just like Jonah did. Jonah's running endangered uh, a boat of sailors and an entire city that's in danger of imminent judgment. When we run from representing Jesus to our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers around the world, we endanger them because God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. If we don't get that message out in winsome and loving ways, they don't get that message. And if they don't get that message, they don't get God's reconciliation. That's God's plan. And it it involves us. And we are that vital link that that, uh, as we represent Jesus and implore people to, to... be reconciled to God. So we, when we run from our role of representing Jesus, we display hypocrisy, we endanger others, and finally we invite God's discipline into our own lives. God is not going to give up on Jonah easily. And he's not going to give up on Nineveh easily. And he wants to bring these two together because his plan involves both of them. And so God starts to meddle in Jonah's life. He starts to turn up the heat on Jonah to bring him to a point of obedience. And God does that with us too. We don't always know exactly what that looks like, but we can know this, that God loves the world too much to let us walk away from our responsibility. And God loves us too much as well. He's created us for good works, and he wants us to connect with those good works. So he starts to meddle, and he starts to discipline, and he he works in our lives to bring us back to a point of obedience. And the truth is, we can can refuse that. But if we don't respond, we will sometimes experience what I think is the ultimate discipline, and that is God just removes us from his plan. He puts us uh, on on the shelf. If we won't be faithful messengers of God's love, God allows us to sideline ourselves. And he will, uh, he's not going to give up on the rest of the world, but he'll let us sideline ourselves and he'll work with those who want to obey him. I can't think of anything I want less for me. And I'll bet as a church, Trinity Bible Church can't think of anything that we want less for ourselves than for God to sh- put us on the shelf as a church for lack of responsiveness. When we run from representing Jesus, we are the weak link. And we uh, risk hypocrisy, we risk endangering others, we invite God's discipline into our lives. We are the link between God's mercy and a world in need. But we don't have to be a weak link. We don't have to be a weak link. We can uh, instead be responsive to God's call to be his ambassadors, to represent Jesus to others. You and I, we're the link between God's mercy and the salvation of people, and so we need to respond to that and not run from it. So don't be the weak link between God and your family, between God and your neighbors, between God and the people that uh, cross paths with you. Don't be the weak link. Instead, respond to your role as an ambassador, as a representative of God who has a loving heart, so much so that that he wants people to know what what, uh, comes as a result of sin and that it's not necessary and we can escape the consequences of our sin through Jesus, the one that God sent. Now this is something that we're going to work on as a church. We're going to work on being the church scattered and being Jesus to the people in our paths as a church. And so to do that, we're going to refresh something that Trinity's done before, and uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, resurrect that discipline and that practice as a church. And that is just the simple practice of knowing our neighbors. But knowing our neighbors is just a pretty good baseline for the church 
scattered. And a few years ago, Trinity went through the process of uh, the exercise of learning our neighbors' names uh, using a simple grid that looked like this. It's a simple tic-tac-toe shaped piece of paper and it's got your home in the middle and it's surrounded by eight other squares. And it's just a simple tool to help us learn, remember, and pray for our neighbors. So what you do is you learn the names of your neighbors and you write one simple fact and one in-depth fact about those neighbors. And uh, that's, that's where we start. <laughs> We're just going to start. It's not, that's not the finish line. That's honestly... When, when we do this, we're moving up to the starting line. That's all. But surely we can and should at least do this. Know the names of our neighbors. Now, I know that not everybody's neighborhood looks exactly like this. Your home and all, you know, perfectly surrounded. So, so uh, our neighborhoods look different. Yours may resemble this a little bit. Or you may live in a dorm or an apartment complex that kind of uh, makes this look super simple. But it doesn't matter what our neighbors neighborhoods look like. We can all use this simple graphic. So what a great goal for our church. And what a powerful thing for everyone at Trinity to know the names. There are eight boxes here. So eight's a, eight's a good goal. What, what if everyone at Trinity knew the names of the eight families who lived closest to them? What if we not only knew their names, but we knew one simple fact? Uh, they work at such and such a place. Or one in-depth fact, I know a little bit about their story. That would be so powerful. And again, that's not the finish line. Honestly, that's the starting line for us. So as a church, we want to we get to the starting line where everyone in our faith family is able to know the names of our neighbors. And I can, I can guarantee that as we do that, the results will be very powerful. And we'll be able to represent Jesus to the people in our paths. And uh, here's something important that for us to think about and be aware of as a church, that in the years ahead, the greatest impact of Trinity Bible Church is not going to be at 800 West Campbell, 400 West Campbell. It's not going to be at 400 West Campbell. It's going to be scattered in the neighborhoods, in the apartments, in the dorms where we live and the places where we work. It's not going to be the corner where our church building is. It's going to be where the people of Trinity Bible Church live our lives and intersect with the lives of people who know God. We can't shrink from that responsibility. We do not want to be the weak link in God's gospel chain. So, here's what you can do. Uh, you're all, uh, watching this online, and so we have a way for you to get this into your hands. Uh, we have both magnets that you could send us a note. Send us a note at office at trinitybiblechurch.com, and we'll send you a magnet. Uh, or you can download a PDF. Liz will give instructions on how you can download a PDF of this and print it yourself. But as we emerge from hibernation this spring both COVID hibernation and just the, the impact of this winter that we've had. And we begin crawling out of our caves, so to speak. Uh, we're going to use this new start to begin connecting with our neighbors. And so uh, my encouragement to you is to take this seriously. Work on this. Fill, fill as much of it out as you already know. And then begin to pray and look for opportunities to complete this. And then make this something that you are aware of, that you keep before you, that you pray about, and we'll just see as a church where God takes us after that. So that's my encouragement to you. Um, my, this, is a big, this is a big endeavor, right? And so we need God's help, and we want to pray for that. So if you'll do that with me. Father, we are so thankful that you are merciful because even in your announcements of judgment and the consequences of sin, there's mercy in that because Jesus is the one you sent so that we can be reconciled to you. We've heard that message. We've responded to it. 
but so many have not. And we don't want uh, your grace to stop with us. And so my prayer is that you will help us as we represent Jesus, that you help us not to run from that responsibility, but to take it seriously. And that as we get practical about it and begin to become aware of and connected to our neighbors, the people that you providentially have placed around us, that that would be the beginning of a new level of effectiveness and a new level of faithfulness on our part to represent Jesus to the people you've called us to implore. And we ask that as we do that, your spirit would enable us and that people would come to know the rescue of your son who otherwise would not. We are thankful for your mercy and grace. And we thank you through Jesus. Amen. So as Pastor Brad said, we will be talking about who is your neighbor. Um, and as he said, we do have magnets as well as these little postcards. Um, you can get these by, remember that beginning part with the connect card? Now, fill out the connect card now. If you want a magnet or one of these little postcards, go ahead and let us know on the connect card in the comment section. Just say, I would like a magnet. I would like a postcard. Make sure we have your address and we will send that to you. If you would like to have it right now, um, when you go to trinitybible.link slash neighbor, you can get a downloadable PDF that you can print out. You could print out a ton of them. You can get to know your entire city if you want using these, if you want them off of the PDF. So connect card for a magnet or a postcard, or go to trinitybible.link slash neighbor for a downloadable PDF. Um, this just made me think of when the snow hit, my husband and I really were hit with, we don't know who our neighbors are. So we knew we were having a hard time and we didn't know if our neighbors were because we didn't know any of them. We knew them by sight, but we don't know their names. We don't talk to them. So this has come at a perfect time where we are really looking to, we need to know our neighbors, how we can help them and how we can love them well. Can't really do that if you don't know who they are. So hopefully we can fill this out too. As always, there are three ways that you can give and help our ministries. You can do that during or via the mail, text, or online. All that information is right there for you. And to send you off into the week, let me read you a benediction out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Pray you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next time. Bye.